Hello, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 559th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Don Addis, Stephanie D'Alessandro, and Marianne Cause on the event of Surrealism Without Borders on view at the Tate through August 29th. We are thrilled to welcome poet Jacob Kahn here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Today's conversation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can view the full archive of this series. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Don Addis is responsible for some of the most important exhibitions in London and overseas over the past 30 years, most recently The Color of My Dreams, The Surrealist Revolution in Art at the Vancouver Art Gallery. She is a fellow of the British Academy and has published standard works on photo montage, data, surrealism, women artists, and Mexican muralists. Stephanie D'Alessandro is the Leonard A. Lauder Curator for Modern Art and Senior Research Coordinator at the Met and Co-Curator of Surrealism Beyond Borders. She has also organized several exhibitions for Chicago, including Poetics of Scale, Matisse, Radical Invention, Tarsila do Amaral, Inventing Modern Art in Brazil, and several others. Distinguished professor of several literature PhD programs at CUNY, Marianne Koss holds a Doctor of Humane Letters, is an officer in the Palme Académique, a chevalier in the Ordre des Arts et Lettres, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the author, editor, and co-editor of several publications. And with that, I will turn it over to Marianne. Thank you so much. Hear me? Good. Well, this is the very auspicious uh, Friday the 13th, so we're talking about surrealism. And uh, Stephanie, who organized the exhibit, is going to be showing the slides. And I'm so pleased that we get to see them and want to talk about the first one now. And this, of course, is the title. And I'm sure it took a long time to come up with the title and all those other possibilities were sort of in the waiting room. And am I not right, Stephanie? It took about seven years to kind of put this together, including the title. It did. Um, thank you so much um, for um, Marianne and Dawn for being here with me today. I can't imagine how lucky I am to speak with you both. Your work has been so important to me and I'm so pleased to speak with everyone at the Brooklyn Rail today. Um, it was a project that took a really long time and honestly it could have taken longer, but there's a certain moment when an exhibition is on the books and that's the time you have to do it. So Matthew Gale and I sort of had this looming um, this looming deadline. And I just want to stress at the very start, because I think we've all experienced some of this, working during a pandemic made our team even stronger. And both of you were part of that team. Um, but at the Met, it included Sean O'Hanlon and Laura, Lauren Rosati, and there were also uh, members from Tate and Modern. But we had truly an international cohort of collaborators, research people, contributors to the catalog, vetters of our checklist. Um, and it's not a show that we could have done on our own. So seven years is because of so many other people who helped us. Um, the title was a hard one and there were some questions about what it should be. We had been using as a kind of temporary imagination kind of title, Global Surrealism, which I never really thought would be a great title because it sort of suggests exactly what we didn't want it to be, which is surrealism as a brand like Coca-Cola that just gets picked up and it's exactly the same thing. And we didn't want to chart the pickup and spread of something that was the same. We really wanted to talk about, and this is what I think the exhibition is about, charting the life of an idea in all the ways, all the ways and, and means that it can um, exist and be um, adopted and take root or skip over um, in many different places and over many different times. And so for us, Surrealism Beyond Borders was relatively quick when we got serious about a title because we were thinking about pushing beyond everyone's expectation and our definitions, but also the literal pushing beyond the borders of what we knew already. Um, geographically, et cetera. Thank you. 
so much. Can we see the next one? Because that's yeah. introducing it also. Ooh. There we go. So, uh, so many things that we can all talk about, especially you, Stephanie, but I was thinking what overall things right now might you and Matthew have wanted to change, like at the beginning, had you been able to, what kind of story or stories are you now thinking you would have wanted to tell along all these different paths that you had of approaching it? Well, I'd like to hear from you and Don about what you think we could have also included. I would say the one thing off the bat was, you know, our work was um, hampered, challenged by the pandemic. And just at the time that we handed in our checklist, our official first version of a checklist, by which then we would start to travel and see things and hone and the pandemic hit. And so Matthew and I were not able to travel anywhere. We did all of our work, all of our loan negotiations, et cetera, virtually, which was quite impossible. And the one place I really feel like, well, there are a lot of places that I wish we could have represented. We weren't able to focus on Nagoya and Osaka and the story of photo groups there that I thought was really important. Um, but I also wanted to tell, I wanted to be able to have more opportunity to think about artists like Colette Om Om Omagbai, who's a Nigerian painter who identified herself as a surrealist and sort of you know, post-World War II moment. And the story there was one that I didn't have the expertise to develop, nor could I find many uh, during the pandemic that it felt like there was enough time to really do the research for. So there were there are stories and people, especially her, that I wish we could have brought into the show. But I think the structure of the show helped to make it more of a smorgasbord kind of offering as opposed to what we never really wanted it to be, which was a definitive a survey of everything that was surrealist. So there was some forgiveness, but if I had the chance, she's definitely someone I would want to include. Thank you. And I love the next slide because it's this again, but bigger. And I'm thinking about openings and all these incredible openings that one could take. I mean, every single person who went into that exhibit was taking different openings. And I, I really love that. And uh, I see the kind of difficulties you must have had. I mean, what amazing research. And what sort of discoveries did you make, Stephanie, when you were you and Matthew were doing it? Were there things that changed the tellings of it as you went on? Well, I think having the chance to work with so many people in so many different places it gave us an opportunity to really, um, you know, we came to this as students, not as experts. We didn't know what we would find. And I think um, we started with, this is kind of a, a dopey idea, but it really worked for us, which was we, we started this, what we called Artist Atlas. And we went through every classic narrative that we could find, every listing of surrealists, every international representation, and literally put them into the places where they claimed to be. Um, and if, you, if one looked at the Artist Atlas today, you might see for Asia, the entire country for Asia, only Japan represented. Um, and so we asked, it, it, at least for myself, my expectation at a certain point was, if it was just Japan that was represented, that's the only place really where surrealism happened. And so it was marvelous to start from a very basic question to say, well, is really that the only place? Might surrealism have happened in Korea? Might it have happened in China, Thailand? And to find people who could work with us, who were intrigued by the idea, who maybe had never been asked the question before, but working together um, we, we were able to, you know, there were lots of discoveries like um, um, Maria Clara Bernal, who Don, you know quite well, um, great scholar of Latin American art. She's the one who discovered Porras and Grau's wonderful photographs at the, at the, at the Casa Grau. Um, and that inclusion of these two Colombian artists experimentation with surrealism as a way to kind of push at a very conservative society was a wonderful, wonderful surprise for us. It, it was really through the kinds of connections that we had surprises. Um, I just want to share one, one crazy story because the opening of the exhibition is actually this wonderful work, which I always imagined in my mind as the work 
for the opening of the exhibition, at least in New York, because for me, it's always been one that is humorous. It's a domestic space, but it looks out into this promising landscape of sorts. We know that Marcel Jean made it while he was uh, kind of stuck in Budapest during the war. Um, it's actually painted on armoire doors. Um, but so we had designed the entire exhibition with this as the first work and even four days before the work arrived, we weren't sure that we would get the visa for the courier who had to come to bring the work. So even at the very end, I don't wanna call it surrealist inspiration, but we had to be very nimble and quick thinking, um, even at the installation time, thank God it arrived and we were able to do what we needed to do, but I had to already be thinking, okay, well, if we need to tell the story a different way, what can I take from someplace else and bring it to the front? And the exhibition in many ways, the ways that we describe, we, we kind of laid out the works, even in the catalog, it is in many ways a, a, a set of cards that can be um, kind of, you know, dealt in, in many different ways. And shuffled, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Can we have, um, I, I, yeah. That, that leads to a oh. question. I, I, I wanted to ask Stephanie on the back of what you were saying, Marianne, um, about the installation of the exhibitions um, in New York and in London. And I just wondered whether while you were installing, you found that your, your paper plans on the walls actually worked as you had hoped they would, or were there things, again, to come back to this question, that you would have done differently at all mm -hmm. in, your, in your installation? Um, it's, Matthew, a really, unfortunately, it's a yeah, really good are. question. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's a good one for two maybe surprising um, reasons also, which are maybe un unexpected ones. Traditionally, curators put together a list of works and they go to see them and you have a sense of its scale. There's something surprising about its physical making. Um, you know what the frame looks like. You've got a lot of information you can bring back to share with your colleagues as you continue to work on the book. And often um, when it's time for the exhibition, you're one of the lucky people in the room when the crate is opened, who knows what everyone will see and everyone else has this wonderful surprise. But this was an exhibition where I couldn't see anything. The only things I saw were things in New York and a few things in Chicago. And I was very lucky to go to The Hague and see the Clean Kerchief Journal and make those selections. But that was it. And I've never installed an exhibition. I've never worked on a show where I didn't have a physical experience and knowledge of the works before. So um, I think there are many things to say about what I might have changed or brought out, especially in the labels. I think um, you might remember that wonderful Japanese, uh, the painting by the Japanese artist Koga Harue that was called The Sea from 1929 with the kind of Western bathing beauty and the suit and the, and the dirigible on the top. And um, had I gone to see that work as I had wished, I would have wanted to know more about the history of the painting as it related to the artist's biography, because we know he made that work in 29. He died, I think, in 33, something like that. And the work, as I understand it, was a part of his studio that was basically hidden during the war as surrealism became more and more dangerous as an idea in Japan. And the picture has a lot of cracks along the uh, horizontal cracks that suggest it was rolled. So it would have been wonderful to look at more of his work and understand more of the, the life of surrealism as something that was so dangerous that, you know, its physical trace of secrecy um, being hidden was actually on the surface of one of the works that we had. Um, as far as the paper plans went, um, yeah, you know, human nature is what it is. So some things were bigger than we thought they were going to be and sometimes smaller. And we had a lot of virtual couriers for this exhibition. So we had giant paper, especially because we had kind of eccentric installations. Uh, we had big paper plans for things that we had to tape out to an inch of its life, each of them, so that when one work was installed and the courier was on the line, we could install that one work. So there was always a little bit of, you know, biting one's, one's lips and holding, hoping that it would work out. But for the most part, it, I was happy with the kind of, um, you know, there's an element of kismet in it, which, which, which felt like appropriate somehow with the show. 
love it. So the next one that leads right into it, uh, right into the idea of the dreams and the objects and all that. And I was thinking, uh, of course, we're all thinking about dreams and surrealism and Freud and all that. But I was looking at the poetic objects and thinking, Dawn, about your essay, the wonderful one on objects. And can you just say a word about how these got chosen? Because they're so extraordinary. I mean, I spent hours, you know, in front of one window. So anything about the objects? Oh, well, well I, I wasn't the one to choose them. That was yeah, Stephanie and, and Matthew. So um, well, not to, to an extent. I mean, obviously, we discussed it a little bit in terms of how the essay should be structured. Um, but I think they're, they are actually a wonderful, very surprising. You can just see them in the, in the top right uh, image here. Um, and it includes Joyce Monsoor's um, um, a disagreeable object, I think it is, rather than object agréable, an agreeable object, a disagreeable object, which is which is stuck full of full of pins, rather rather like a, a sort of fetish object, but also rather like the coronavirus thing, uh, rather, rather <laughs> sinisterly. Um, <laughs> and 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 so, well, I mean, the, the thing about I think the objects, in a way, are among the the the, the products, if you like. Um, from surrealism that have had the most impact mm -hmm. over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, um, but they are, un you, you can't categorize them in, in aesthetic terms at all uh, because they are simultaneously, um, they are poet, we call them poetic objects, but simultaneously they are made from real things in the world, real uh, stuff that's picked up, stuff that's, that's found. Um, so they have, you know, they're, they're part of the real world, but at the same time, they are not useful. So they are, they are not what we traditionally think of as being the objects we live with every day. So, so it's playing with that, that relationship, I think. Um, there was also Dali's Lobster Telephone and that wonderful Seychelles hoof. I mean, many of the objects actually have writing on. And unfortunately, we couldn't get one of the André Breton objects, which is, which is actually a poem, a poem object. But it, it's a very, very elastic category, um, I think. Don, I wonder what you think also about, I, I know you remember when Matthew and I shared the checklist with you, how some of the categories that we had seen that we wanted to kind of draw out, how hard it was to find transnational examples of things. Like it was very easy if we want to do poetic objects to think of Magritte and Dali and Duchamp, whoever else, like lots of great Cahun, uh, or I'm um, sorry, not Cahun, Oppenheim. Um, but we were trying to push at a larger representation. And um, with all your experience, especially Latin America, I'm thinking, um, well, I, have I, you I, found also, I guess my question is sort of because they are often familiar objects, non useful, have have many of have you seen many things kind of in the flesh from Latin America, for example, because we had a really hard time, especially during the pandemic, trying to, you know, find more. That's a that's a very good question, and I'm um, I'm just trying to trying to think that I can imagine something. But I was just going to comment on your point about how you made the selection and what categories you were working with, and I think one of the things that comes out so clearly is that. What you chose actually exceeded the idea of categories altogether and I think you were very wise in following up all sorts of leads that led in odd directions um, and I would, I would just say quickly that uh, I doubt whether there's any expert so-called expert on surrealism um, beside you and Matthew who would have known all the, the, the all the people you've included, all the artists you've included, um, probably all the places you've included in this exhibition. I mean, it is truly astonishing you. <laughs> what you have what you've brought together. And I keep going through the catalogue and finding new things and new names. It, it really takes a long time. I've been to the exhibition several times, still find new things all the time. That wasn't your question, I'm sorry, but- No, that was, that's okay. I have to put that, that in. very nice <laughs> of you to say. But I remember, um, for example, we had that wonderful illustration from Leitmotif, of the surrealist exhibition of objects in Santiago. And I, I'm assuming yeah. that those are all lost today. You know, oh, but well, we I have this so. kind of grainy photo. And I think part of the reason why they're so fascinating for people is because they're kind of these mythic 
strange things that we can't find anymore? Well, quite often, actually, I think that particular grainy photo, of it, I, think, I believe there's a sort of tilted chair and, and, and kind of nets of some kind in it. And very often these objects were actually part of a larger installation um, and, and, you know, but belonged in a, in a, as it were, a, a moment, a moment of the installation. Um, some of them were made specifically as objects, but many actually come, come out of that context, I think. I also love the the uncanny part of the voices in that sort of side room and the way that went into the dreaming and the whole, I kept listening and listening and listening. I love that this exhibit is so about listening as well as seeing, it seemed to me just, just perfect. Thank you. I guess we should go to the next slide, but I love the whole dream thing. Okay, so here we are doing all this amazing stuff and we have Chicago Surrealism and uh, Vifredo Lam, my very favorite from Cuba and journals from all over. And then of course, uh, in Mexico, uh, Remedios Faro and all. So uh, Stephanie, can you start with maybe the Chicago Surrealism thing? Sure. Sure. And I just, I should also say the, you know, the exhibition, if you didn't go to the show, at least in, uh, at the Met, but I, I don't know why it's not also in London. Um, we really organized the show. We wanted to challenge the idea of a narrative, at least a chronological narrative or one voice that decides what's in and what's out. And so we also wanted to give a sense of uh, a kind of chorus of ideas of the life of surrealism and its experiences. And so rather than be um, super sort of like gallery one, gallery two, um, the, gal the slide you just saw were a set of galleries that were focused on big ideas, like the dream that were, uh, that were defined transnationally and trans uh, chronologically transhistorically. And these are a set of rooms that show what we called convergence points, places where surrealism bubbled up at a certain moment in time. We also had a number of galleries that focused on travelers or people who uh, sort of brought surrealism one place to another for a variety of reasons, just to give different senses of how surrealism might have been useful. Um, but Chicago was a particularly special story for me because I before coming to the Met, worked at the Art Institute of Chicago and I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And I never knew that there were there were surrealists in Chicago. They are an amazing radical bunch and I have enjoyed every moment that I've gotten to know them. Know them. Um, that was my one of my, my trips was to meet uh, Penelope Rosemont and Paul Guerin and Beth Guerin and um, to learn more about the amazing enterprise that they envisioned for themselves. And what I find remarkable about, I mean, they made artworks, but Matthew and I were so impressed with this moment of 68, that that's a recognizable moment for many of us, but the particular way that political um, urgency and surrealist kind of radicality merged together at this moment. And the surrealists were out at the convention demonstrations, passing out leaflets, surrealism and revolution really met um, in this kind of youth culture at this moment. Um, and what was also important about them is to me, I mean, there's many reasons they're important, but another amazing um, thing that I, that I found about them was the way that they were, I mean, in many ways, uh, the Rosemonts led the way for Matthew and I to do the exhibition that we're doing. Their sense of reaching out across generations to many places in the world. They published the Arab uh, Surrealist Manifesto. They uh, had Leonora Carrington and Toyan illustrate their uh, their journals. They were just gathering all surrealism as this hungry bunch, just trying to bring it all together and see this kind of unity. And I have to say, uh, our exhibition couldn't have had the better inspiration. And in many ways, I felt like we were picking up after their the, the big part of their work. Although, of course, I'm still looking at the things they're doing now. That's great. And Dawn, you want to take take over a little bit about, you know, Spanish language and Haiti and Mexico City and all that, because it is so extraordinary. Um, well, yes, that was a, another particular story. And you can see from this, uh, from these two slides, how totally different, in a sense, the, you know, the, the objects are, the works are, the atmosphere is there, which is, which is something we might come, come back to. Um, Mexico, well, of course, uh, Stephanie will have a story about the three paintings you can see on the 
on the wall there on the left, the bottom right hand slide by Remedios Baro, um, which are which are a triptych. Stephanie, would you would you like sure. to say something about that? So so Varro um, made these works. I, it's been uh, probably going to say it wrong, so apologies to the experts out there. I think she made them in 1961 and mm -hmm. exhibited them that same year. And they are kind of by autobiography, kind of uh, kind of fable of uh, basically this group of women, and especially one at the end who um, is under the kind of control of a man um, in the middle. They're embroidering this mantle for the earth and in the end escaping. So in many ways, um, experts on Varro talk about this as a, as a um, kind of call to freedom for herself and her friends in Mexico who were devising their own experience of planning things out using surrealism upon their arrival in Mexico City after or sort of as emigres during World War II. And um, what's amazing is these pictures had not been shown together since that one exhibition in 1961. And so we were able to bring them together. Um, it's been a long time that they've been with their siblings. Um, and it was remarkable to see the works together. And when apparently when the um, courier, I don't know who it was quite, brought them to Tate, uh, I think hadn't seen them in New York probably. And, and she, she wept seeing yes. them together for the first time the since courier, 1961. The courier, the courier who brought them yes. to, Mexico, to, to New York, York did the same thing. Well, she sat, it she was, sat it was, gave her a chair actually, and she asked if she could just sit for a while. Look, look look at them. But it is an incredibly powerful um, room, the room with the, with the largely women of the Surrealist group. And of course, Leonora Carrington, with whom I'm sure many people are familiar, far less familiar probably to you would be somebody who was never really associated directly with the, the group of surrealists in Mexico City, but was um, not, nonetheless affiliated through her friendship with Antonio Artaud, and that is Maria Izquierdo. And it is wonderful to see two works by Izquierdo. I was, I was surprised, it was great, um, in, in this exhibition. And, and she, she was a very strong character and in, in, a, in a more direct way in some respects than Remedios. She addresses the, the position of, of, of women in the patriarchal world. Uh, and there's a little watercolor there um, called Allegory of Work. It's very William Blake-like. Mm -hmm. It shows, shows a, a woman kneeling with these enormous male legs striding over the mountains above her. It's, it's an extraordinary, very, very uh, powerful work. But that, that little group in Mexico City was, you know, was, was, a, was a proper center in the sense of surrealism with, with Perret, constantly there. But I would just say that I've been reading the correspondence between Breton and Perret during the war. Breton, of course, in New York, Perret in Mexico City, both of them exiles from the European war. And Perret is constantly writing to Breton saying, we have absolutely no money. And Remedios can't paint. She's having to do all sorts of sort of propaganda posters and so on. And so for several years, she was actually unable to paint at all because they were they were so, um, so poverty stricken. There was no work that, that Perret could find. Um, so I think they were all, I mean, what they did produce during the forties and, and fifties is, is really very extraordinary. And, but they still remain very committed uh, to, to surrealism. That's such an interesting idea to, you know, if you look at um, Izquierda's career, you think almost that she, you know, she sort of came to life after the 40s, you wouldn't necessarily know that it was because of financial hardship that she wasn't really able to do work. That was Remedios was, sorry. Yes. Was, oh, sorry, was, Remedios. Remedios. But, yes. but very interesting to think about that as another factor in trying to understand artists' careers. Yes, and yes Recover exactly. their work too. And in this wonderful exhibition, you of course have something else by Remedios Varro, which is that wonderful kind of horse thing. And it's so extraordinary. Margaret Carson has written a lot on this. Everything about this exhibition was extraordinary. And now we've got to travel to the Ted Jones that everybody adores. Can we have the next slide? That enormous thing, the thing that captivated everybody that unfolds. And you know, you would go and there would everybody was <laughs> going right out with it. And the whole the issue of Eugenio Garnell, whom I did meet and thought it was amazing the way he could bring his students and his art and everything 
transporting across borders. So it's like this big migratory kind of thing that's set up. I think they're two good examples of how we wanted to make um, the idea of travel and exile and migration a part of the story. And there are many other ways that it is in the exhibition, but you know, Grinnell is someone who's persecuted because of his political situation. And so you know, he fought in the Spanish Civil War and then had to flee and he ends up um, in, where does he arrive first now? I can't remember, Santo Domingo. And then from there goes to Guatemala and then finally arrives in Puerto Rico. And each time he, he's there for a bit of time, each time he's there, he participates, he writes articles, he's on the radio, he's in, explaining about modern art, but more specifically surrealism, he's bringing people along. And when he arrives in Puerto Rico, he also teaches a number of students who make their own surrealist group. Um, and I love the idea of the power of an idea driving one artist across a whole area of the world and still basically being threatened with his life, believes it strongly enough that he continues to do so and that power inspiring a number of other artists to take up their own group, very different than his interest in surrealism, but still um, with the same kind of urgency for them, thinking about a different set of more um, younger generational kinds of issues, but very exciting, I think. Um, but Ted Jones um, is a special person, I think. he. I had to fight to give everybody their due because I could have done a whole exhibition of Ted Jones. But Long Distance was this mythic work for me and Matthew and the whole team. And it was so special because, you know, it's something that Jones made over a very long period of time. And his sense of travel in my mind is very mixed with his ability to be a surrealist. He left the United States in 76 um, at a time when he felt that to be an artist, he had to go because as a black man, the endemic racism of the United States wouldn't allow him the freedom that he needed. And he wasn't a vagabond, but, he, but travel itself, moving from um, Europe to Africa, to Latin America, uh, to Canada, coming back to the United States and this wonderful exquisite corpse, this unfolding creative work um, accompanying him. And you know, he didn't just ask anybody to do it. He carried it with him or he sent it ahead. And as he met people who were part of his own surrealist community, he built his own surrealist you know, um, kind of group um, or this, you know, a set, you know, if you think about a diaspora and a community and a kind of network, he sort of envisioned one by including the people who he chose to include. And I just, it was so special for us working on the show in the pandemic, virtually, we hadn't seen each other in so long. And without being sort of overly sentimental, just to share, you know, especially as someone who dreamed about this object and couldn't see it for so long, when it arrived in early August, we didn't really know how long it was. And so we actually built, to your question before Marianne, we built this extravagant long vitrine thinking, well, surely it can't be longer than this. And we built this kind of curve in it to add even some more space to make sure we could do that. The work arrived a little early and we kind of mocked up a whole um, kind of jerry-rigged display. Um, and that was the only time that the paper conservator, actually Rachel Mostalish, who did an amazing job, figured out a display mechanism for it as well. All of this happening just weeks before the show. But we all came in one day in August with the lender and we all had our masks on and this beautiful thing was unfolded for the first time. And there was this moment where we had to take this thing very carefully and slide it up onto the ramp so that this kind of jerry-rigged thing, so we could make sure that the curve would actually work. And it was such a beautiful moment. The, the conservator said, okay, everybody take the sides together. We had to do it very carefully together. And we all sort of grabbed this thing. Not the, I don't mean to say we were touching the work, we were touching the sides of this uh, support. But I looked down the table at my colleagues as we were about to touch it. And, everybody was smiling and we were all looking at each other and it was so beautiful to imagine this work bringing all of us together as well after not having been together and I know it's not at all the same as Ted Jones's experience but it was just such a powerful um, moment I felt it was nice to share because 
you know, lots, I saw lots of nose prints on the glass um, here in New York. I know a lot of people really enjoyed it, but that was a special one that I think behind the scenes is worth sharing. And that's just beautiful. Can we have the next one? Yeah. About photography, because I love the oceans and the ships and the idea of travel and that whole thing. Dawn, you want to say something about photography? Because you know lots about that. Oh, um, well, that's a very big, big subject, but just, I, I'll well, okay. try and say something about it in a minute. But I'm just looking, this is the work that Maria Clara Bernal uncovered, I think, in, um, in, in Bogot, in Bog oh, perhaps it's in Cartagena. I'm not quite sure where it, where it was. It's Cartagena. Cartagena, yes. Um, I find it, it's, 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 a it's a lovely piece, um, I mean, or, or pieces. It's very, it's very kind of private. Um, and there's this sort of contrast between the doubling of, of uh, uh, Cecilia Porras as she goes up the steps and then this strange shrouded figure under, under the hill. I mean, they're, they're playing, there's some kind of story going on there. You aren't quite sure what it is. Um, some, something is, something is happening in those, in those settings. But I mean, photography is uh, one, I mean, so many of the mediums, um, you know, have 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 been in some way subverted by by surrealism, but but the way that the photography that we think of probably as being a kind of true record of something, a true record of a person, a true record of a face, a true record of a place, um, turns out really not to be quite that. And surrealism was was really extraordinarily good at uncovering basically the uncanny in the photograph, um, and of course also photo montage and collage, uh, very, very central to the surrealist use of this kind of medium. But, but these are very special as, as, as photographs of, of something that's being enacted. And there's a wonderful set of photographs also of um, Leonora Carrington that appeared in the Mexican magazine Snob, um, where, where again, that something is being enacted of, of, a, of a rather sinister and definitely uncanny kind. Well, speaking of that, look at the next one. I mean, this just astonishes me, this entire next one. The kerchief and the whole, the whole thing and that whole group, the DSZ, everything about this is fascinating to me. So unlike many of the other exhibitions, I just love it. Either of you want to say anything about it, which is just astonishing to me, this whole Gertrude Pop is fascinating and the whole, the whole issue is. This was another one of our, our wonderful collaborators, Tessel Baudin, who's a great scholar of surrealism as well. And she brought this discovery for her to us in one of our many workshops. Dawn, I think you were there that time when she spoke mm -hmm. about, about Clean yeah. Kerchief. And I think all of us were riveted by the story of the urgency of a group of people during, during uh, Nazi occupation in The Hague um, working on Monday nights, feeling, you know, again, that sense of community and network um, in the worst of times, not being able to travel um, and kind of doing something quietly. And the idea of, you know, they made this unpublished journal beginning in 1941, all the way through to 44, uh, 36 numbers. Um, and they did it by when they were finished with the volume, basically closing it and putting it in a drawer. And then they were on to the next. And, um, you know, if there was a valuable trip, sitting in Utrecht with Tessel and Matthew, um, actually, we were in, yes, we were in Utrecht, um, flipping pages of this journal very carefully uh, and seeing how, as the volumes went, the things that they could write about became smaller and smaller. There were articles that were like the books on my bookshelf. And then it was just a list of titles, but the drawings became more and more poetic. Um, and um, the connections between the poem on one side and something like a ink splatter, like you see at the, on the bottom, right? That could be read as blood at the same time. Um, but they were very special and a kind of antidote to the idea of being able to travel, I think. Yeah. Can we have the next one? Because yeah. we're still on same wonderful thing. So these are all these women. Here's the Mansour, the Joyce Mansour, whom we've been translating right now yet again. And all these wonderful women and their 
creations are totally extraordinary. All of them, every single one. Uh, either of you want to, Stephanie, how about having chosen these for this slide? Well, um, I think there's probably lots to say. I think I was really interested in, um, I was first of all, so glad to hear that the Venice Biennale includes historical examples yeah. of female surrealists. It's really, really great. I was, um, and Matthew, you know, we did the checklist several times. And to be quite frank, when we got a great checklist together and we were really proud, we sat down and counted and we ended up crossing things out and looking for more women or more people from Asia, or we really wanted to kind of push and do something different. So I think there are a number of great works um, that I just, we just had to have in the show, like the Eileen Agar, for example, and that exquisite Leonora Carrington Cahoon, of course, but um, you know, Mansour seemed like a fun one to bring in and Tarsila is not really a surrealist, but connected to surrealism but and delightful yeah but but both you and dawn have written so much on women and I, i'm curious how you feel about this like new field of women's surrealists because it doesn't feel so new it just feels like finally people are paying attention i think that's called discovery and relooking and all that kind of thing can we have the next one because this is exactly about the same thing it's the surrealism i mean this is a photography thing and i love the one on the left the Toshiko, the call, is that not superb? It, yeah. It's wonderful. It, she, I mean, she, she was working in the 50s, I think, and she was a friend of Takiguchi, yes, in, in Japan, which, which is very strange. The story of surrealism or surrealisms yes. in Japan yes. is, is, is quite strange. But this is really worth having a close look at, and I think you can see it on the screen. Um, I mean, she, she, there's this very sort of glamorous, confident, secure, it seems, woman sitting there. Yeah. And behind her, there's a scene of destruction and, and, a, and a huge wave and, and, a, and a snarling dog. And, and it's as though she, and then there's another arm that comes round her. So in fact, it turns out not to be quite what you think at all, this photo montage. It's a very, uh, it, it is a photo montage, obviously. It's not a, not a photograph. Um, but it's, it's this sort of contrast. And I think it really expresses that sense of sort of post-war anxiety of trying to get back to normal, but you can't quite. There's a, there's a real sense of, of disruption and disturbance there. And that um, is called the call, is that Kind not? of with the glamour, yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, because the call to us to take another look at everything all on top of each other. And of course, yes. uh, the pair you do, we all know very well. Mm -hmm. But this whole, this, this grouping just fascinated me. I mean, everybody. Anything you want to add that, that, Stephanie? Yeah. yeah. Don, did, were you going to say something? Well, I was only going to say it's not just something because it's inspired by the, the Dora Ma um, of Pell Ubu um, from 36, of how important photographic close-up was in mm -hmm. surrealism, in, you know, in defamiliarizing and disorienting what you think is, um, a relatively straightforward thing. I mean, for a long time, people were not at all sure what that is that, that Dora Maar photographed in close up. Um, and I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another know, wonderful yeah. photo that I, I wish now that I had added to this um, set, which is that wonderful work by Itabel that's called The Embrace, yeah. that yeah. looks like a monument. And Embrace makes it sound like it's two things kind of tightly connected. But in point of fact, it's some kind of rib from an animal that's like kind of dis, you know, destroyed meat or like rotted meat or something. So it's something that you want to get close to, but it's completely abject when you when you recognize what you're looking at. Yeah. And how many times have you seen an armadillo fetus? I mean, that's it's so extraordinarily peculiar. And that peculiarity, you know, the whole idea of surrealism as dangerous and peculiar. I think this does it just perfectly. And of course, it was yeah. on a lot of postcards and everything. Can we have the next one? I mean, because I'm looking at the time I see. So this is surrealism around the world. And here's Tropique that Dawn might want to say something about. This is wonderful. I love this whole thing. Yes, I, I, I love this this double page spread of surrealism around the world, oh, 1937 from from the surrealist magazine Minotaur, um, which it shows already how 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 very uh, very extensive the network was, and how 
actually um, people's work was being recognized. And I mean, I, I'm not gonna say anything about, about <laughs> centralization, I'm, but just look at that as oh. citizen of the world, very, very generous. Um, <laughs> and a, a lot of uh, uh, exhibition catalogs and um, magazines like Man Mandragora from Chile. And I partly have to make a sort of confession here, though it'll, we'll come on to it with the next slide, uh, which is that I, failed to include either Mandragora or Tropique in the exhibition that I organized in 1978, which was centered on the Surrealist Review. And I've been trying to make up for it ever since in a way, but I, I do think that Tropique was hugely important, um, really a very important factor uh, in, um, in the, the way that Surrealism was, was actually in a sense fed into very strong anti-colonial feeling in Martinique, where uh, the the policy, the French policy of, of cultural assimilation was being resisted by people like the poet Aimé Césaire and Suzanne Césaire, who were the editors of Tropique. Um, and it is a lot about a search for new identity, and it's full of extraordinary things. And it's the magazine, it's a magazine that, um, that Breton, it, it, was, it, was, it was being published um, before there was any contact with, with Breton. Uh, though Aimé uh, Césaire knew a little bit about what was going on in Paris before, but it was quite independent in a sense. And Breton chanced on a copy of this um, in a little shop when he was on his way in, into exile for, uh, uh, in Port-au-Prince. And he was amazed by it because it takes a very strong line on issues of, of, of identity, but always with poetry at the center. I mean, it's a magazine which is full of um, wonderful poems, uh, many by Aimé Seda himself, but by others as well. Okay, I guess we should go to the next slide, which is- of oh, it's not this one, sorry, it's the one after, yeah, sorry. Hmm. Um, we'll move on to the next one. I think yeah, we no, just I put this in here as that's, an example of the spread of- the like spread, journals. right. Yes. Okay, so we should talk a little bit about Dylan's surrealism and all of that. And Dawn has done that wonderful thing on Dada, and we all care a lot about them being sort of together and not always so separate. So, uh, can you say a little bit about that, Dawn? Because um, well, yeah, this this is one of the <laughs> installation shot of, of of a peculiarly inadequate kind on the left. I'm sorry about that. It, they're just a whole set of little black and white photos that we managed to take. This is an exhibition that I was a sort of junior member of the um, of the curatorial committee uh, it took place in 1978 and uh, I, looking back on it well you can see from the installation shot what the purpose of the show was from my point of view which was to um, try and um, try and place the works the works that have become very familiar and were you know defining surrealism in the public eye works by Dali and Magritte and so on but put them into their context in the Sirius reviews, which the Sirius magazines um, and the Dada magazines too, which I've always regarded as sort of the lifeblood in different ways of each of those, um, um, I don't want to call them, I mean, not really more well, movements, yes, Dada and Surrealism. And so the slide on the left was shows on, on the left-hand side, um, the big screen that we'd had at the entrance to each of the sections, each section was devoted to a particular magazine, and that was the one for La Révolution Surréaliste. And you can see one of the opening uh, sort of photo, oh no, it's the last one actually, um, Je ne vois pas la femme dans la forêt, and the, uh, the, the red lips which introduced the second manifesto of surrealism. Um, so that was, that was the idea, but I just want to say that one of the biggest um, debates, let's say, uh, in the curator, in, in the in the committee, was when the exhibition should end. What should be the final thing? Um, the uh, because th this was, I mean, it's it's very strange to think this now because I think one of the many things that your exhibition, Stephanie, has achieved is actually uh, really putting an end to that discussion altogether of what constituted the end of surrealism mm -hmm. um, that we, we I mean different different moments have been chosen in William Rubin's exhibition uh, Dada and Surrealist Art 
uh, he was basically assuming that it, it that it just slid into abstract expressionism through through the uh, through the painters like Gorky and so on through the sort of revival of automatism and it more or less ended in well, exactly when it was but in the in the forties. Um, so so I think so I think it's it's ex extremely interesting that this exhibition has. Uh, raised the question again. I mean, it, it's it's not saying this was surrealism. It's saying what is surrealism, and that's the question that it seems to me uh, remains so important. And actually, that was the title of a wonderful anthology by edited by Franklin Rosemont that came out at the same time uh, as my exhibition um, Dada and Surrealism Reviewed, and I'm afraid. Uh, there was no recognition, really, of the activities of the, of the Chicago group. So I think there was a kind of um, a, a kind of art world politics going on, uh, which which meant that people were included, included or excluded for all sorts of reasons. And that's a story that still really has to be told. Um, I, I think also there's the question of yoking together Dada and surrealism, which we could talk about, but that would take us a very yes. a very long way. But 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 they were still very much seen as, as together, I mean, together in a sense, you know, against the canon of modernism. That's how I would see them at, at the time. Well, that leads right to the next slide, exactly. Because uh, when I did this Surrealist Painters and Poets, uh, there were things in there which got left out in the big uh, 2004 Surrealism, big thing with fight on. I had no agent, it was terrible. They took, in reprinting it, they took out all original texts by the Surrealists, what? But in this, this first one with MIT, at least I was allowed to talk about Malcolm de Chazal, whom I find incredibly important, but we've all done anthologies. Uh, Don, you want to say one more anthological thing? Um, well, I, I, I did a, a, a couple of readers, uh, the, the second, yeah. oh, the yeah. Dada reader, which which I must say was one of the my favorite things. I loved it. <laughs> Dada was so different. And then with 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 Michael Richardson, we worked on the the, um, the, the surrealist reader, okay. and that yeah. was also important because these were texts that were not widely known and had never been translated. So it seemed to me it was it was bringing certain things forward again, which had been forgotten because there was there was such a sort of conditioning if you like, cultural conditioning of the way people received surrealism and saw surrealism. I, I, it had to be shaken up a bit. Well, if I may say, um, you know, each project depends on projects that came before. And um, the exhibition that exists today certainly could not have happened without these projects. But I think also what I find interesting is what you just said about conditions. I mean, I, having walked through the show and read people's reactions, I think it's really interesting that there are a number of people who, um, and this is not like, I don't wanna start a debate or something with people, but just that I've heard, it's interesting to hear people surprised by what they've seen because it's not what they expect. And it makes me aware so much of how as human beings, we, there's just this kind of, um, What's the word? There's this kind of an industry almost, you know, our taste, our expectation is built on what we see in our art history books, what we see in the classroom, what we read, what we see in the museum. And then when we go to a surrealism exhibition, we expect to see whatever that is. And um, I think that's the same with putting any of these kinds of publications together. There's nothing, we can't be comprehensive. We can be instigatory, I guess is a way to put it. Um, but we're always fighting against ourselves a bit, as much as we're trying to push forward, I think. So in the next one, of course, that uh, that's everything. That is everything. <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> and we could sort of say more about this, and then maybe even if we have to stop there. But this is totally extraordinary. So surrealism, modernism, and everything, and you could both start. So Dawn, why don't you start with this? So this, is, this is like, what? Yes. Um, yeah, I did see this in um, when Brehon was, uh, sorry, not, he wasn't alive, but it was still there in his studio, uh, this this wall with 
so many objects, which I'm sure he rearranged all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much there, I don't know where to begin. You can, you can see what, what an amazing uh, conglomeration it is. But one thing I particularly wanted to point out was the Alberto Huronelia, because he is someone who, who tends to get left out, <laughs> um, another Mexican artist. But he was, he was very, I mean, he, he addressed, you know, classic European art, the history of European art, in a sense, from a surrealist perspective in, in very, very interesting and challenging uh, ways. So uh, it, his is the sort of curious box thing on the left hand side and in a way that actually I think it gave the structure of the entire wall all those um the boxes and the shelves that, that got built built on if you like in the center you can see Giacometti's wooden um suspended ball it's like everything mm. um go to the next one we're going to end on openings again but this is so how you chose the films is fantastic. How did you do that, Stephanie? Uh, well, I have to give big kudos to Lauren Rosati, um, the assistant curator here in the Modern and Contemporary Department, who worked on this and kept finding great stuff and kept pushing and pushing and pushing. But when we made our final selection, um, I think we were trying to find ones that could be poetic, um, you know, could help us with some representation, but also could take us in another direction. And it was so important to have films in the exhibition, oh, one, yes. because they were made, they were a part of it. We had radio plays, you know, broadcasts in this show, and we really felt like film was an important part of it. But also having something kind of living in the space also, I think, helped with the sense that this was not like the Breton wall, you know, something encased and calcified, but that it's still moving forward. Um, this is the least calcifying exhibit I've yeah. seen for years, <laughs> seriously. And we're gonna end on the last one because it's about opening again. So there we are again. And I do That's think that, that, you know, post exhibition, Stephanie, anything that you would now wish you could add like right now, post. Well, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure both of you would agree, it, one could easily do a whole other exhibition. Yes. Whether I have another seven years or the energy to do it is a question, but I hope that um, it's an instigation and um, inspiring for other people to find, you know, locate some of the artists we've, we focused on and give them more attention or focus on some of the places we weren't able to include. Aleppo was a, was a city that we really wanted to present work, but we weren't able to. Um, there's still so much more to do. This exhibition is not a, a definitive project by any stretch of the imagination. And don't you love the Venice Biennale is so Leonora Carrington, so surrealism mm -hmm. and all that. And, mm -hmm. and you know how histories are always being rewritten. So both of you have <laughs> done so amazingly historical and trans-historical. So Dawn, how about if you were doing this like right now, I'm looking at it again, either at the Tate or here, how would you, would you tell the same kind of story? I know they're not narrations, there's so many paths, but is there anything that you'd want to add like now? Well, I, I'm just interested in what you, you mentioned, um, not really adding, but I think what deserves more attention we is radio, it. radio, I mean, broadcast, very yeah. interesting, the non-visual, because in some ways, uh, that, that helps to get you away from this incredibly um, narrow view of visual surrealism, which is still very, very, um, very pertinent. And I, and I think that both, I think the radio, and that reminds me, what can be done in radio in terms of, of you know, the imaginary is, is, is fascinating. Um, and it reminds me of some of the film scenarios that were written, which, which were impossible to make. So they were just, as it were, the idea of films that might be, um, but that would be on, um, on, on except as cartoons. Um, what, not, what would I do? I don't know. I mean, I was just so fascinated. There's so much in this one. I, 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 I don't know. But what I, one of the things I particularly loved about it, actually, and I don't know whether this is the same in, in, in was the same in New York or whether it's just London, was the way that in London, you ended up with what you would have begun with in a classic historical exhibition about surrealism, which is the idea of automatism. And there it is, 
But at the very end, when you've gone through everything else and it shows you there's another way of telling the story. You don't have to do it chronologically. You don't have to have to do it according to just the Paris Centre. You can do it in these extraordinarily diverse ways. So congratulations, Stephanie. Thank you. Oh, it's so great. Thanks to you both. Stephanie, you get the last word because this is all about openings, as you see. Well, then I'll just say thank you to both of you again, because your work was incredibly important to myself and to Matthew, and you were both wonderful resources and cheerleaders on the side. And, um, you know, when you're taking, sticking your toe in surrealism, it's a daunting task. And it was great to have both of you there to catch me if I fell. I love the toe because you, I so often feel I'm flat footed in surrealism because you can't get back to the amazing sort of magic of it because you feel flat footed now. So I, I love this exhibit. Everybody did. I know now we're having q and I'm aware of that. Anyway, thank you both. Thank you. Wow, thank you all um, so, so much. It's been incredible. Um, let's see, for our first question um, is Jared still with us? Uh, that's a great question in the chat that he might have got back. Um, uh, how about let's go to GE? Um, we should be able to unmute. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And what a what a wonderful panel. So honored to just get to hear this today and then see these things. Now my question, which which I would ask of anyone who really wants to answer it, can we generalize that to be a surrealist artist is not just about making art, but but also about um, to redeem the art in existing things to uncover the art in the found world? Yes, I, 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 I do think that. Um, can I say something very quickly, I, I hope in relation to that, yes, um, which is, to, which is to, to quote the opening line from, from Breton's, uh, the essays on surrealism and painting, um, uh, when he says, the, the eye exists in a savage state. And of course, um, in a way it doesn't, because our vision is, is one of the sort of most culturally conditioned of all our senses. So it was an aspiration, and it was an aspiration. And I do think that, that the Surrealists were actually, you know, in a way moving towards that realization of, of a kind of, you know, a savage, an eye that was not just conditioned by what the capitalist world wants you to produce as a painting for a gallery. Um, the irony is, in a sense, that Surrealism itself has become very, you know, visually conditioned and, you know, and people expect certain things from an exhibition about it, which I think is again, something this exhibition succeeds in, in, in shaking. Um, and, and, you know, there is no surrealist style. We, uh, we say that again and again, but it, it has to be insisted on. Sorry, does that- The catalog is wonderful. Stephanie, I mean, the catalog is absolutely superb. I could have gotten six copies. I only got a few, but wow. You well, want to say something about anything? Well, I just want to add, I think, um, GE, you have a great question. And I think back to the poetic objects that we talked about in the beginning and in the, in the first exhibition of surrealist objects. In 1936, there were categories of made things, but there were also natural perturbed things and scientific objects. And those were all things, as Dawn said, that maybe with a more savage eye, you would happen on something in the real world that you know, had a spark to it. Um, I think it's absolutely right to see that reimagination and, and reinvigoration of the world around us. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you for that wonderful question. Um, next, I will turn it over to Margaret. Um, you should be able to unmute. Yes, okay, hi. Um, what an extraordinary show and I live in New York and I went to visit it uh, so frequently and now I'm missing it. I miss not being able to see it. Um, and there were so many highlights, including the Remedios Varro and the, um, the Homo Rodans, which I think is a, another surrealist object. Um, and I also thought, of, and the Ted Jones was just mind blowing. And um, I uh, appreciated your story so much about the installation. 
Um, I'd also suggest that, that uh, it's a collaborative work. It could be a, a surrealist object. And, um, and I was also very curious about the vitrine, which displayed all of the envelopes that um, the uh, long distance was uh, mailed in. So like a sort of a mail art, but also itself a surrealist object. So yeah. I was, could you speak more about that? And sure, why you decided sure. to display that? Uh, well, because it's a part of the work. I mean, to me, that that object, as I've come to understand it, is one that uh, grew. So initially, Ted Jones found that paper in a dumpster, apparently in Midtown Manhattan one night before he left. He it was that old kind of printer paper with the holes. He cut it in half. And so if you look carefully at the object, you'll see that sometimes there's green and white lines behind the drawings and sometimes mm -hmm. it's and the holes change places because he's turned it over so he folded it up and when it's folded it's a small it's it's smaller than this book I mean it's a little small little thing that he could carry but as he carried it he carried it in an envelope to protect it uh it got that envelope got kind of threadbare and so he put it in another envelope and then when you know he'd send it ahead to some place and then as that envelope became threadbare he'd put it in another and so um many of you can probably understand if i use this term it became a kind of turducken of envelopes after a period of time mm -hmm. and what i thought was so wonderful was that when it was time to add a drawing he would have to take it out of each of these envelopes like a creature that was shedding its skins and so those envelopes mm -hmm. are actually called the skins mm -hmm. and it was a kind of I, I don't know if if he intended it specifically to be this but i imagine it as a kind of performance almost so those skins are a part of the object but we just didn't have space in the vitrine to also include the envelopes there if we did i mean that would have been the best but mm -hmm. you know doing it virtually and um, on on the fly we ended up with a case on the side that had all the skins thank you you're very welcome Thanks. thank you so much um i believe we have jared back if i you should be able to unmute to ask your question hello yeah hi uh thank you everyone um don stephanie and marianne um my question was i was really uh fascinated by the photography um, and I, uh, just so I'm remembering, I'm just going to read my comment. Um, I wonder if there are any thoughts about, uh, lighting or levels of, uh, exposure in surrealist photography. Um, Dora Maar, I think in particular for me, uh, across her portraits, um, there seems to be an interesting combination or mix between, uh, the depth of shadows, um, and also a sort of uh, angelic effulgence, uh, a radiance that um, seems to interact um, in, in a lot of her photographs. So I'm just wondering again, um, if there are any thoughts about uh, the surrealist use of, of exposure and lighting and what that might try to communicate. Thank you. Brilliant question, great. Um, I think it would be really fascinating to look at some of those Dora Maar portraits, beside fashion photography, beside um, sort of people like Peter Rose Pullum, that, that sort of period in the 30s. Because I do think sometimes that's kind of glamorous and sharp. And I think Dora Mars, said there, there tends to be a lot of shadowing, I, I quite agree, uh, almost sort of deliberately going against that clarity. I, I don't know, I, I think there's a lot more one could do about that, but I think it, it, one would need to look at you know, quite a lot of Quite a lot of examples and have a have a good think about it <laughs> but that's great dawn because in the fashion magazine i got to write about dora ma and i thought it was just fascinating you know that she cared so much about her hats and the way and everything and that kind of looking at it through the eyes of a fashionista sort of thing was absolutely you know mesmerizing like you never want to get out of it Amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, for that question. Um, next, I'd love to turn it over to Michael. Are you able to unmute there? Okay. Hello. Uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about like whether uh, surrealism was a kind of form of cultural 
uh, colonialism in some ways as it went to these other countries. And I'm, and on the other on the back side of that, I'm wondering if as surrealism went into other countries, did it change the basic nature of what surrealism is because of how the other countries interpreted surrealism? Mm -hmm. Um, how about I start and then you both chime in because that's such a great question, Michael. We could have a conversation for hours about this. My feeling is that um, it's part of the reason why we wanted to kind of talk about, um, we didn't want to use the term um, global surrealism because what we felt from our research was that surrealism was something that was um, gravitated to by some artists um, because it was a modern style. Um, and sometimes it was something that was really interesting. Um, we, we tried to, I'm not really saying this very well, but what I mean to say is the artists who gravitated to surrealism because of an interest, because of, an, of it as an idea or a kind of proposition for something that offered change from their present condition, let's say a kind of revolution or rebellion from an existing state tended to choose from it what they wanted and not full sail. Breton says it's this, so we will do it this way. Sometimes they didn't even read Breton. Sometimes they learned about surrealism from a journal that had maybe interpret, how do I say this exactly? Each time it's, it's specific, so I don't wanna get overly detailed, but surrealism gets interpreted and used in many different places for very specific purposes, often as a way to overcome. If it's a kind of nationalistic moment or conservative moment, artists use it in their own way as a way to rebel against that or to offer some kind of opportunity beyond. Sometimes it's used in the case of parts of the Caribbean as part of a way to fight against a colonial kind of heritage. The places that the places we tried to look at were not ones necessarily who um, uh, whole, wholesale took on what, what came from Paris. And I think there's so much more to say, but I think Don and Marianne, you should add to this because I feel like I'm kind of stumbling at a better answer. Yeah, you know, it's there that Ben no surrealist style, uh, style as such, and that seemed that seems to me magnificent and having it set up as an idea and a dangerous idea and a re-looking at kind of idea seems perfect. Oh, but I, okay. yeah, well, I, I would also say, I think I agree with absolutely all that, but um, I don't think there was actually ever a sort of basic fixed idea of what surrealism was. Um, so it, it wasn't a matter of something being exported in, in that sense, because from the, I mean, again, I'm sorry, this, this actually does lead one back to quoting Breton again, but um, <laughs> it, 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 the, the, what, 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 he, what was being proposed in a way was a series of experiments and journeys. And in fact, the, yeah. the, the, the analogy or the sort of metaphor of the, the journey or the voyage is so often um, built into some of the most important of the uh, the surrealist texts, and so it was it was never sort of something that people could could sort of you know subscribe to very clearly. It, I mean, it always involved a two a two way movement. You know, you didn't just sit there and have it come at you and say, "Oh, I can do that." No, it it, it had to involve activity, <laughs> as it were, from those who were who were kind of looking at it from wherever it might be, whether it's sort of Paris or um, Seoul or Cape Town, I, you know, anything. So, so I'm just saying that it, so I think it's always there to be, to, you know, to be developed and changed. So the question to what is surrealism seems to me to actually remain. That was the title of, as I said, this real Franklin Rosemont um, anthology. It was the title of Breton's own 1934 um, attempt to, you know, to summarize what surrealism was then. And he summarized it by quoting back from previous texts and sort of saying, well, actually, you know, that was wrong. <laughs> we, we should go beyond this. So, so I mean, I, I think obviously, the, you know, the other aspect of what you're saying is, is um, 
can it ever not be a colonial imposition because of coming from Europe? And um, I love your journey and the fact that it isn't about where it stops. It isn't about arrival. And so it is ongoing. That seems to me to be the spirit of surrealism as we conceive it now, sort of relooking and it's going on. It's not like it stops. And... Well, take I'm just just one thing that I've been rather hoping to get a moment to quote, actually, which which, which is Ted Jones again. And I and I think this is really important because it's also something that links to the Chicago through this, and that is the importance of jazz in the post-war period. Now, famously, of course, the Surrealists were supposed not to like music. Well, this really wasn't quite true, but it came back in a big way in, in the sort of post-war period, particularly in Chicago. And, and this is what Ted Jones said. Jazz is my religion and Surrealism my point of view. Jazz is the most democratic art form on the face of earth. It's a surreal music, a surreality. Surrealism, like jazz, is not a style, it's not a dogmatic approach to the arts like cubism. But I think that's, I th I think that's, that's important to me that um, there's a new, something new there. Uh, always something possibly new. If I could add one more thing, I think it would just be that um, even though we, we will always wanna trace surrealism back to Breton and Paris, even at that very moment, I don't think Breton imagined it as a Paris art yeah. movement. He imagined it and his friends imagined it and many of the people who wrote in the beginning from Europe imagined it as an international movement. And even though that time was mixed with colonial issues and other things that we have that legacy today, I still think at its very essence they were imagining something that even when they published all the places that surrealism had been around the world, it was excitement about those networks and exchanges and not so much like we have conquered all these places, but it gets mixed up in history at the same time. But I think at its roots, it was meant to be a kind of universal um, possibility for people. Yeah, I love the word possibility. That seems just right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for that excellent question. Um, next, I would love to turn it over to Nick. Um, I, I, once, I, I once more want to thank you all for joining today and what an honor it is. And um, this has been really wonderful. Uh, my question is, is more for Marianne and for Dawn. Um, as, as sort of experts in this area of art history, I'm curious if this exhibition um, offered a perspective that you hadn't considered before, or, or, or more or less, maybe you know what what was the most surprising thing that you saw or encountered with this, with this exhibition? It seemed to me to be walking through it, and you know, to have Stephanie walking through it. I love that walk. It seemed to me to be about one of the most excitingly traversing kind of experiences of an exhibition. It seemed to me an exhibition that you experience. Yes, I, th I think, I, I think I, you know, I was constantly surprised by it too. Um, I was surprised by many things. I mean, there's a, so many fascinating hidden histories. I mean, it, it was, a, it was a, the, whole, the whole exhibition in many ways was, was an uncovering of a, a whole series of really, really forgotten hidden things, um, hidden histories. Uh, particularly in places like China and Korea, and <laughs> that, that was that was a surprise to me, um, and I thought that was that was really fascinating. Um, yes, I mean, I, mean, I, th I think th th there's a question we we probably quite correctly avoided discussing, which is which is the distinction between the terms international and transnational. I'm not going to go into that, but just to say that. One of the things surrealism certainly did was offer forms of resistance, which are just as important today as they ever were, because one of the things capitalism wants is for us all to want the same thing, for us all to need the same thing. And surrealism was very much in that sense following Freud and saying, well, everybody is actually different, but they don't know what their differences are because you know they don't even know themselves. You know, your your unconscious is a is a is a you know we we can try what we can do to get a glimpse into it but there it is sort of boiling away underneath and that that's hidden so I'm just saying that and that's for everybody different and that that is true um I think for everyone 
Thank you both. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Our final question will be from our very own Fong. Hello, Fong, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Congratulations, Stephanie. Um, on the show we I saw in New York, I'm not so sure I can make it to London to see the version there. And, and uh, thank you, Marianne and Don, for being part of this conversation. Uh, I, in fact, came late. I was this morning uh, having a uh, lengthy interview with the filmmaker, mystic Godfrey Reggio. And we somehow was talking about Neoplatonism and particularly Francis Yates' book, Giordano Bruno and Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. So, in you know, inevitably, the, the subject of magic became quite prominent. <laughs> we, we carry on talking for a long time, and I can't help but to think of um, Kurt Seligman, great book on magic, history of magic, which was published, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Marianne or, or Dawn or Stephanie. Might have been published in 1948, which was the year that Osho Gorky took his life, who is a very uh, seminal figure who made the transition between surrealism to the beginning of abstract expressionism. And my question is very simple uh, in that I know that Seligman portray in his own painting the fantastic imagery of troubadours from medieval time and night with macabre ritual and doing all sort of things. Uh, had an argument with um, with <laughs> with actually um, Breton, which essentially he was kicked out uh, out of the surrealist group in New York. Um, so. I just want to ask whether that is correct. Um, is that correct information and how it was perceived at the time when the book came out? Can you remember? Uh, well, uh, yes, I mean, it's true, I think. Yes, it's true. And I would just say that the question of magic is one of the, what do one call it, sort of fuse point in surrealism. and. Uh, Breton and Perret disagreed about magic, and Seligman just went went a bit too far towards the um, you know the, the the beyond. Let's put it that way, just a bit too far. And about l'art magique, which we were supposed to translate, and somehow the middle seemed a little bit boring. And you know the Breton part is wonderful, and so then we gave up. Though at some point probably we could pick it up again, but. I was asked to do it many, many years ago, and I said, oh, my goodness. And then I was right to say, oh, my goodness. And by the time you're saying, oh, my goodness, you know, life is over and La Magique goes on. But it's very long. It has the most wonderful questionnaire in the middle of it. I and mean, you may say it's boring, but actually it's pretty interesting. Um, many different responses. And Leonora Carrington's one is particularly good about magic. Right. I Got my um, answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Congratulations again, Stephanie. Thank you. On a great show. And uh, thank, you. thank you. Back to you, Caroline. Thank you, Fan. Thank you all so much. Um, uh, well, what a wonderful maybe way to end a conversation about surrealism um, with some poetry. I, uh, we always end our community events with a reading and I'm so thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Jacob Kahn, to the stage. Jacob Kahn is the author of Mine a Blog, forthcoming from Roof Books uh, late this year and um, multiple chapbooks, including A is for Aegis from Double Cross Press. His writing features in several publications, most recently in uh, Salones de Belleza, the beauty salon. He's an editor of the poetry chapbook press and reading series, Islet Press, which he co-founded. And with that, I would love to turn it over to you. Jacob, thanks so much for being here. Wow, thank you so much, um, Caroline, for inviting me um, and um, Nick for helping set this up. Don, Marianne, and Stephanie, that was a wonderful conversation. Um, just make sure everyone can hear me. 
thumbs up. Cool. Um, yeah, just wanted to say that that was, I mean, it's such a stimulating show. I wish I could make it. I'm on the West Coast in California, but just viewing the materials and, and being a part of this conversation um, was really uh, insightful and kind of groundbreaking. Um, I really like Don's point about the end of the end, um, the end of the end of this conversation um, and the breadth of influence and the decanonization is super critical. These shows do so much work. Um, I'm thinking about Leonora Carrington and how her work has kind of risen to prominence um, in the last five, 10 years. And it's because of work like this to rediscover these people. And now it's a mainstream voice that we all kind of look to. Um, so I'm looking forward to discovering more artists um, from this show and seeing those connections. Um, so I'll read some quick poems um, and uh, thanks again. Um, kind of in the spirit of talking about collage, this is called Allegory of Pragmatism. Want me to tell you about the collage I'm making? One giant walnut with a child behind it, his fingers oozing green jello onto the Golden Gate skyline. The photo from a book by Richard Misroff, Berkeley chronicler of clouds, etc., in land of Lil B and Pharaoh Sanders, Bayer Pharmaceuticals. And above it, Seraph Gee cut out from a Trader Joe's coupon book, my slice of market apocrypha, meant to soothe then alarm like a burgeoning conscience. Can you keep a secret? At first, soothe meant to see truth before it became to assure someone that what you are seeing is true. Today, my boss told me he's seen it all. By this, he means the idea of therapy change. I guess someone brought in a rat and said it was for emotional support. Then someone else brought in a parrot. When orthodoxy widens, does the world accept it? Banana in the shape of a kangaroo with her front legs tucked and her back outstretched in her sleep. Like Christopher Smart gazing upon his decadent Jeffrey, I turn from brazen God to paper mache form and melt into the couch. An allegory of what? Pragmatism? Squinting slightly, perhaps from staring long into a mirror the library book says of Jan van Eyck in, his, in the portrait many think as him wearing a red headdress because in his Arnolfini portrait, the painter appears in similar garb in a convex mirror on the room's far wall, a semi blur in a wedding portrait for a merchant of Bruges. This is a century before Parmigianino's more famous, more famous to poets rendition. And the author says small dogs here represent fidelity Hence the name Fido, I suppose. Um, this is, um, so I, I'm writing a book that's um, partially based off of Virgil's eclogues um, and they're sort of, recon, they're, they're sort of um, recontextualizations of the eclogues in present day. Um, this is the sixth eclogue, it's called Automatic Cancellation. Sipping the aloe of partial employment, I unlock the hatchback, I discontentedly brim, a dog on its side in the porphyry wilds. Through me pass words, syntams, waning bits of formulae, what Barthes calls densification, floating bereft and commensurate, like dumplings in a broth. It comes down to whether you display an intent on the road to the Colosseum, I saw a lesser god with its mouth full, almost a nymph. And like that, I like to put entire lines into the search bar to see what comes next. Unlicensed lyric, unlicensed Gothic lyric, basically about Berkeley, California, the big trees shaking with malware and the vegan delicacies of indigestible melon and all the organisms onward crawling to the bunk beds that await our ungratified sucking at the foot of the bridge. Have you heard of turn spit dogs? Small dogs that turned spits of meat in the 16th century by walking inside a wheel. The British loved to roast beef like this. Linnaeus called them Canis vertigus, the dizzy dog usually comments, burning skulls and epic reverberation. 
To be honest, you're the third trimmer to recommend me that five-toed footwear. As in both instances of undertaking, I had hopes of singling out what goes without saying, a little clause in my contract, little known, little like, either clot or exude. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. And again, thanks for such a wonderful conversation. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful way to close us off here. Um, just an immense thank you, of course, to Don and Stephanie and Marianne for this conversation. Um, a historical one, I think. Uh, the recording of this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and events are kept shortly. Um, as a small nonprofit, the Brooklyn Rail uh, needs your support. Please check the chat um, again for a link to donate to support our operations here. And please join us Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Nari Ward and Jasmine Batario. And we will conclude with a poetry reading from Benjamin Kesslin. And you can now please turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick and Carolyn and everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This has been amazing. Thank you. Congratulations, Stephanie, and those Thank who you. later. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. My goodness. What, a, what an event. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for the reading. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Fung. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Great poetry, man. Thank, thank you, you, Stephanie. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Everything y'all do at the you, Brooklyn Fung. Rail. Yeah, thank you for the Brooklyn Rail. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. We'll post it on YouTube tomorrow. So we will send it out for those who didn't get a chance to be with us today. So congratulations again. Please keep up the good work. And thank, thank you. you. And with love and congratulations and courage. Yes. Thank you, Fang. And Bye enjoy everyone. the rest of your enjoy the rest of your Friday. Yes. The Have a great Thank weekend, you. Marianne. Thank, Thank you. you. All of you. Bye. Stephanie. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone.